So as we look through history, uh, we often see the little guy at the mercy of the empire. The big, uh, the vast empires or the rich, the powerful, whoever it may be. The, you know, the rich and the powerful are in charge and the little guy is the one who's on the end of the, the boot uh, underneath. And we've seen that all the way through history. Um, I think even in these times, I was struck by this a little, um, you know, a few months ago we had the G7 uh, summit down in Cornwall. And um, there were the, what, the leaders of the seven, you know, biggest uh, economies or something in the world. And they had um, Boris Johnson, of course, there. And um, they had uh, Joe Biden from America. And you know, they were all getting together. And, um, you know, it was all a very special kind of big thing. And as if to say, you know, we are sorting out the world's problems. You, you just sit there. You sit there and we'll sort everything out. Um, and I think that it's, it seems to me that this is becoming a bigger, uh, a bigger thing. Or you've got things, for example, something which I wasn't really, didn't pay any attention to until fairly recently. Things like the World Economic Forum, where the, um, uh, every year the world's rich and powerful get together to discuss um, what, what should be done in our society. And they're thinking about what, what life should be like after the, the pandemic. And they're making plans. Um, and, um, you know, again, it's this, this idea that ordinary people are quite powerless in this. And that, you know, that, that they've, they've got all of these plans, but, but what about us? Um, and sadly, as we, we know through the lesson from history, is that empires are rarely, if ever, friendly towards Christians. And that seems to be the thing. You know, ever since the days of the Tower of Babel, when, when men, uh, when people get together, they get together against God. That's how it works. And I don't know what it is, um, but I, I think there is something about human nature, isn't it, that... You know, when people get together and form an empire, it's never friendly to God. And that's why I think Daniel is a really important book for us to be looking at, because it, it helps us to know how to, to interpret that, how to understand what's happening, how to relate to it as well and think about it as, as Christians. So um, last week we were looking at the first half of Daniel chapter 2, and um, we were thinking about how um, Daniel and, and actually Nebuchadnezzar inadvertently kind of exposes the, the failure of the pagan religion, this, um, the religion of the Babylonian Empire. And uh, we're reminded of that again in verse uh, 27, where Daniel says, uh, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king uh, the mystery he's asked about. So it's kind of a little just a reminder again no, you can't do it. Humanly speaking, it's impossible, but, he says, verse 28 there, but there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Do you remember that book that I've mentioned a couple of times, The God Who Is There by Francis Schaeffer? The God Who Is There. And I think that's something which I've been coming back to often. Um, and it's something which really makes a difference here, isn't it? You know, Daniel shows the God who is there because he's the one who um, God has revealed the mystery to. And Daniel, um, and this is, this is, is lovely, isn't it? He, he gives glory to God. He doesn't take all the credit himself. You know, he doesn't pray and he get, gets his friends to pray and then take all the credit for revealing the mystery himself. He doesn't say to Nebuchadnezzar, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, well, I'm, I'm very clever, actually. Um, you know, I've worked it out all by myself, um, but actually he gives glory to God. And that's why God gives him the, um, the, the revelation. And so um, Daniel tells him the dream, and we won't go through all of the, the ins and outs of it, but Daniel tells him what he dreamt, which, as, as um, Nebuchadnezzar asked for. And um, it is something which um, which, is in, which is humanly speaking impossible. I mean, unless, um, you know, if you had a dream, unless you told me what it was, I would have absolutely no idea because our dreams are always, you know, never rational in that sense, are they? They're always of very strange things. Um, 
And, and it's no exception here that unless God had given him the, the vision, he wouldn't have been able to tell Nebuchadnezzar. And it reminded me actually of, um, you know, in, in, um, in the Gospels, in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 2, when um, Jesus, that they, the, the, uh, they bring the paralyzed man to Jesus and he, uh, he says, your sins are forgiven. And, um, and they say, what? <laughs> and he says, what's easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk. But in order that the son of, son of man, you may know the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Get up, take up your mat and walk. So the miracle was done to prove to them that Jesus could forgive. And it's like that here, that this miracle is done to prove that Daniel's interpretation is correct. Because Daniel could have made up any, any load of old nonsense if the kid, if, um, the king had told him the vision, the dream. But this proves that it's from God. Only God could have done this. Only God could give the, the, the dream. Only God could give the, the, the interpretation of it as well. So what is the interpretation? What does Daniel say the interpretation is? Well, the first thing that Daniel says is he says, the God of heaven has given you dominion and power. And in your hands, he has placed all mankind. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. So Daniel reminds Nebuchadnezzar to start with that his power comes from God, that he is only there because of, of God. God has given everything to Nebuchadnezzar. And um, that just made me think of you know, Jesus standing in front of Pontius Pilate. And this is an amazing thing to say for Jesus to have said. Pilate says to him, don't you realise that I have the power to crucify you or to release you? And you know what Jesus says to him? You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. That's what Jesus says uh, to Pilate while he's standing there. I think that's such an amazing thing um, to say. And the, the, the witness of the Bible is that power is given from, from above. And the astonishing thing is that that's even true for tyrants and dictators. It's astonishing, isn't it, to think. But even tyrants and dictators uh, get their power from above. Now, that doesn't mean that we should obey everything. And um, I think, you know, why, why is it that God gives people, evil people, these, this power? I don't know the answer to that question entirely. But I think one reason why he, he gives tyrants and dictators their power is to prove that um, he, is, he is God, that he is powerful, and that he's more powerful even than these tyrants and dictators. Um, you think about Daniel, for example, you know, Daniel standing up against Nebuchadnezzar and God wouldn't have had a, the chance to show his power unless it was actually in comparison with what seemed to be the might of, of Babylon. You know, one small man or one a few men standing up against the might of imperial Babylon. And you can say the same about Rome or about any of these other empires. Um, think about the people who smuggle Bibles into China. Now, not by, um, what is it that, that it says, not by might, nor by power, um, but by, by myself, by my name, says the Lord. And then uh, Nebuchadnezzar gets a real um, taking down a peg. Uh, th verse 39, after you, another kingdom will arise. And um, Dale Ralph Davis, who wrote um, the Bible Speaks Today commentary about this, he's got a little phrase, this is the divine after you. And I really like that, the divine after you. Just to say, look, empires never last. You think you're someone, Nebuchadnezzar, but there's coming an empire after you. And actually, if you read on, and we'll come to this as we get to the end of Daniel, um, it's his son or his grandson, his kingdom is taken over by um, Darius or, or Cyrus, the king of the Medes and the Persians. So the Babylonian Empire, the writing was already on the wall at, at this point. Um, empires never last. And that's the point of these, these prophecies, the vision. It's really to say that empires come and go. And that after this, 
there was going to be the Medes and the Persians, there was going to be um, the Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire, there was going to be the Roman Empire, um, many empires. But in verses 44 and 45, he says, um, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to uh, another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. So Daniel says, there is coming a time when God will set up a kingdom that will last forever, and that will crush all of the others, and it will never be destroyed. And it's not, it's not a human kingdom. It's from God. And he says, um, the great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The great God. He's saying, look, you, Nebuchadnezzar, you should be humble because you may think you're something now, but everything, everything that's been, you have has been given by God and that there will come a day when God will, himself will set up a kingdom that will make yours look like nothing, that will crush all of the others. How does Nebuchadnezzar uh, respond? He should, he should respond in humility. He should respond in acknowledging that, um, that everything uh, he, he's been given is from God and by worshipping God. And actually his response is, um, is good, I think. Verse 47, it says, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. So he gives honour to God. And then he, uh, he honours Daniel and, and his friends as well. He, he makes them rulers over the province of Babylon and um, places him in charge and, and so on. So he honours Daniel and he honours his friends. Um, so I think there is some kind of response. And actually reading through um, the book of Daniel, you do get the impression that Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar have a, a good relationship, that Daniel's quite fond of Nebuchadnezzar for all his flaws, and they are many, and we'll come on to that in the, the coming weeks, that actually he does have a, a kind of a grudging acknowledgement, or maybe not, I say grudging actually, um, just an acknowledgement that he's not supreme and he has some sort of fear of the Lord, whatever that may be. So that's a, that's a good thing and that comes from, comes from this, this dream. So God, God was able to do that even in the midst of, of these circumstances. And, just pause for a moment just to think how amazing that is, that Daniel has gone in and the exiles have gone in as a conquered nation. Now, they were the losers. There were just a few of them left. Daniel and, and three of his friends had gone in to the courts of the king. And Nebuchadnezzar is now saying, your God is the true God. You just think what an astonishing turn of events. You know, there is a God in heaven. Well, what, what do we make of this, um, of this passage? What lessons can we, can we learn for today? I think the first thing is that God uh, succeeded where the magicians had failed, where the, the magicians from this pagan religion had failed. And I think that it's important for us to, to remember not to be tempted by, by worldliness, by worldly solutions, by uh, all that happens in the, the empire. So I do think that, you know, certainly in, in our country, we have been living in fairly in a broadly Christian, a broadly Christian country for, a, you know, all of our lifetimes, really. So I don't think we're really used to thinking in these terms. But I think we, the day will come and is coming, may already be here, when we need to choose between the empire or between God. And, you know, we need to be prepared but we mustn't be tempted because God doesn't disappoint because there is a God in heaven and his ways are far better than anything that this world has to offer. It would be like, you know, to turn aside from God would be like Jamie Oliver going to McDonald's or, or something like that. You know, it, why, would you, why would Jamie Oliver, who can, you know, cook lovely meals and things, then go, go to McDonald's for, for a, a, take his wife out to McDonald's for lunch or something? You know, it'd be, um, it'd be a strange thing for him to do, wouldn't it? And, um, and that's, that's the kind of absurdity it would be for us to turn aside from God 
and from his ways. Because we've got what really works. We've got the real deal. Now, we don't have to, to look to um, anything else. And the second thing is that all empires will fall except God's. All empires will fall except God's empire. So don't be tempted to trust in them. Now, don't be tempted to put faith in them. And on the, on the, the flip side of the coin, don't fear them as well. Don't fear the empires because they've been God's in charge. He put them there and he has a purpose for them, which perhaps we don't understand as yet. But what happened with Nebuchadnezzar can happen at any moment uh, with, with God. So, um, so two final thoughts then, just as, we, just as we close. The first one is this, to trust in God, not in the empire. This is what it says in um, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, some of my favourite words in the Bible. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So we must trust in the Lord with all our heart, not in the empire, but in the Lord, in the Lord God. And the second thing is that we should pray for our, our leaders. And this is one which I think um, we don't always do as well as, uh, as we should. I think I, I tend to... Um, uh, yeah, I think I overlook this a little bit, but actually it is biblical. This is what it says in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So... Paul, the apostle, says, pray for kings, pray for rulers, those in authority, so that we may live peaceful and godly lives. Why? Because that aids the gospel, so that all people may come to know uh, God. And it's actually in, in a society like ours where we're able to share the gospel, aren't, aren't we? You know, in, um, so much more difficult in China or in North Korea, particularly, um, other countries where you can't share the gospel, that we must give thanks that you know, we, we do have the freedom to share the gospel while we're here. We must pray for that uh, to continue and we must um, seek to ask, pray to God for our rulers and for rulers around the world um, to, to enable people to have the freedom to, to worship God and to share the good news. So let's, uh, let's take a moment to pray as we uh, come to a close and ask for God's help. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that as we think about uh, Daniel uh, and learn uh, lessons from it, Lord, we do pray that you would help us to trust in you and to remember that your kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus, is an eternal kingdom. And we pray that you would help us to, um, not, to, not to be tempted away to trust in other things, but to trust in you. And we pray as well that you would... Um, for our leaders, for our, our government, and for governments around the world to give freedom to, to people to believe in and worship you and to share the good news as we know that you desire all people to come to salvation. So we pray, Heavenly Father, for your, um, your hand upon us now as, a, as individuals, as a church, and as a country. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.